Welcome and good afternoon. Uh, today's webinar on behalf of the Ontario Centres for Learning, Research and Innovation and Long-Term Care is about training tools to help us improve team response to early acute deterioration in our residents and long-term care homes. My name is Raquel Meyer. I'm a nurse and a health services researcher and I've had the privilege of managing the Baycrest host site of one of the Ontario Centres for learning research and innovation and long-term care, which we of course have shortened to CLRI. So that's how we'll refer to the program. So let's dig in today. You may already be familiar with the Ontario CLRI program, um, but if not, it is a program that has been funded through the Ministry of Health and Long-Term Care since 2012 when it began as a pilot and it became a permanent program in 2017. We really act as a resource for the Ontario long-term care sector to enhance the health and well-being of people who live and work in long-term care. And we do this really by focusing on providing education and training sharing research and innovations, and identifying and developing resources for long-term care homes. We are funded um, to really partner with the sector to provide solutions for priority issues, including our aging population, increasing care complexity, and workforce excellence. We're hosted at three different sites, uh, Baycrest Health Sciences, also Briere in Ottawa, and the Schlegel University of Waterloo Research Institute for Aging. So I'd like to acknowledge um, that the views that we're sharing today uh, do not re necessarily reflect the views of the government. Team Essentials was developed uh, by a large team at Baycrest, uh, but also uh, was developed in conjunction with several Ontario long-term care homes and key stakeholders. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, Jennifer Reguindon, who was uh, critical to the development of Team Essentials for preventing acute deterioration, as well as Shoshana Halfenbaum, who led the development of our leadership coaching. And I'll be talking about that too today. Great. Um, so we had a number of registrants uh, and you're fairly well equally distributed amongst uh, team members, uh, leaders and educators. Uh, we also have people joining us from the community. Uh, so, so welcome. 80% uh, of us are from long-term care homes representing over 125 organizations and 90% uh, of registrants are from Ontario. So welcome to those from outside of Ontario and from the other sectors. Uh, today, our focus is on training resources for Ontario long-term care homes and some of these resources are freely available through our Ontario CLRI website. So if you are from outside of long-term care and would like to access all of the resources, please do connect with us and we'll be providing that contact information at the end of today's session. So today is about sharing training tools with the goal of helping you determine if these tools will help meet your home's learning and performance needs understand how the tools are designed to improve performance and this will include just a bit of context on why and how the tools were developed and finally to help you consider how you can optimize the use of these tools for effective learning and performance change. All right so let's begin with some of the background behind the need and development of these training tools. The tools presented today are part of a larger program made by and for long-term care. We call it Team Essentials Leading Practices for Long-Term Care. And here we were really tasked with tailoring learning content and the format and delivery to meet the needs of our culturally and educationally diverse interprofessional workforce. Knowing that the workforce in long-term care is a little bit different than other sectors. We were also aiming to implement innovative educational approaches to re-engage our long-term care teams in learning, knowing that they often faced uh, repetitive mandatory uh, compliance-based education. 
And finally, we wanted to address priority care issues and performance needs in the current direct care workforce. So there was an extensive process that went underway, uh, but preventing acute deteriorations was selected as a priority uh, to improve team recognition and response um, in order to prevent unnecessary emergency transfers. We also focused on the team response to coordinating care for responsive behaviors to support a reflective and relational approach to dementia care. We have a session section on engaging families in care to build self and team situational awareness to address family and resident concerns with compassion. And as we're very interested in teamwork, uh, we also wanted to explore, reflect, and apply competencies that relate directly directly to effective teamwork, including nonverbal communication, perspective tanking, empathy, and power. Um, and so that's the focus of the fourth section. Uh, today, we're just focusing on preventing acute deterioration today. Now, since 2013, uh, we've had over 3,000 staff and students from a variety of homes and schools attend this. Um, the sessions are open to uh, PSWs, nurses are allied health professions, some are open to support staff, and leaders are encouraged to get involved and to attend. Okay, so this is designed really as a learning to performance program so that we can enable the uptake of leading practices and evidence and foster sustainable practice change. The program is offering integrated solutions grounded in experiential learning, interprofessional and relational practices, and fosters clinical reasoning and teamwork to support homes in mitigating risk and improving performance. All right, um, just briefly, uh, we did identify uh, care competencies from a broad evidence base, qualification, standards, as well as best practice guidelines. But at the same time, we really wanted to have an evidence-informed training approach to meet our learning and performance needs. And so we've integrated various educational, care, and organizational frameworks. I'm happy to talk about these more uh, with you. Perhaps if there's time at the end and you're curious, I'd be happy to delve into them. But just so you know that um, Basically, this is grounded in a constructivist learning approach, which very much supports experiential learning and attends both to kind of knowledge um, acquisition and application, but also the human side of learning was really important. How are we relational with our learners when we want them to be relational with residents? So as many know, um, the prevention of acute deterioration and unnecessary emergency transfers is complex and it's influenced by many factors, including but not limited to the extent to which your home is able to engage with residents and families to build proactive relationships and address advanced care planning, as well as many operational considerations, including access to medical, nurse practitioner and diagnostic services. There are many other factors also. So on the right, you're seeing some clips from a very um, well done short animation that is available on YouTube. Um, and they captured this complexity very nicely. It's a collaborative group in Alberta. And I would encourage you to check out this video as a potential resource for your use, not only for staff education, but also for families and residents. It's a very accessible video. And I want to thank the Kitchener-Waterloo Emergency Transfers Group for pointing that our way. Okay. So in terms of preventing acute deterioration, there are many kind of upstream things that we can be doing, including proactive family engagement and restorative care as prevention. Um, and those are very key. Um, what I will say is that Team Essentials for Preventing Acute Deterioration is a little further along than that. Uh, the focus really is on um, nurses, PSWs, and our allied health professions in terms of early acute deterioration and response to acute emergencies. How do they communicate that amongst each other and with their uh, nurse practitioner and or physician? 
So that's just in terms of the whole process. We're just taking a slice and that's what this is going to cover. Proactive family engagement, however, is built into our team essentials for engaging families in care. So if that's of interest, let us know. Okay, here are a few fun facts about learning that I think um, are important to keep in mind. Um, sometimes I think we're running around trying to use education to put out fires, but here's the facts. Within 24 hours, 70% of our new knowledge is forgotten. However, we can offset that. We can improve the retention rate through interactive and experiential learning. So basically where you get to rehearse repeatedly with feedback and reflection. Spacing out the education instead of doing it all at once is also another way to improve retention. Reinforcement, whether through leadership, peer mentoring, through the structures or processes you have in place um, that support the new learning. Those are also key factors in improving retention and application. And of course, other things like sleep. Who knew that getting a good night's sleep after you've had a long day of education can improve your retention by up to 30%. So there are many factors. These are just a few to keep in mind as we go through today. So often, uh, treaty, training is treated as the full solution and a one-time event. However, when that happens, if you rely solely on training to change your staff's behavior, there's only about 15% of staff who will sustain a new behavior in practice. That said, when training is about 25% of the solution and 75% of the effort is performance support before and after training, you can get uptake of new behaviors, sustained new behaviors, as much as 85%. So we'll be revisiting this a little bit when we talk about leadership coaching. Okay, so let's see what we um, gathered in terms of learning and performance needs. So as you registered, you kindly uh, shared what your priorities were. And so based on the group's responses, here's a word cloud and the most pressing performance needs related to recognition, that early identification came through loud and clear, assessment, uh, communication, and proactivity. Communication with families was key for you, and also how to transfer decisions get made, as well as the interventions and care planning. So underpinning all of this, of course, is the kind of foundational knowledge that's needed, the critical thinking skills, and the ability to engage in care management strategies. And these are really in keeping with what we have assessed and observed in terms of performance needs with respect to preventing acute deterioration. So we did a number of focus groups and interviews with staff, leaders, uh, directors of care. Uh, we did a survey with 300 directors of care and so on to really understand where they, what they needed. And our team-based education and training is designed to address not only knowledge and skill application, but also values and attitudes associated with interprofessional competencies. Additionally, one thing that stood out for me as I looked at the lists um, and compared them, we also found uh, that students and new staff tended to struggle in identifying localized symptom presentation versus generalized symptom presentation. And this is something that actually stood out for us when we applied um, our SOS game app for seniors care. Uh, we used the analytics to understand what cases people were solving well or where they were needing help. And this was definitely an area that stood out for us. So I'll be sharing more about the app today um, and uh, what you can, uh, how you can use it to uh, support learning. Okay, so the training tools that you are seeing today were really created within, within the context of fostering these three learning goals. We wanted teams to recognize common changes in conditions associated with emergency transfers. We wanted them to be able to systematically perform observations of their residents during care. and ultimately accurately and concisely communicate those observations or assessments as well as their actions and interventions with the team in order to engage the team in care planning.
Okay, so let's dig into the resources. Here we go. All right, the first set of resources are really around the actual clinical frameworks that are used. Uh, so we'll be talking about those. Then we'll give you some of the delivery options for this training. And thirdly, we'll give some tips on effective learning to performance and how uh, we have offerings that can support that as well. So this is the bulk of the presentation and we'll be dividing it into these three sections. Now you're most welcome to enter questions you have in the chat box as we go along. I'll take a look every once in a while to answer questions that um, sort of fit in the moment, but also I'm hoping to leave time so that we can have questions at the end also. So please feel free to use the chat box. So by way of context, these training tools were developed in consultation with long-term care in Ontario and designed collaboratively uh, as shown below. Um, it, we then involved ourselves in developmental evaluation as we began our in-person workshops in 2013. And this really helped us inform in real time challenges, uh, changes needed in the innovation that we were developing. So since 2013, over 1,200 learners have participated in this module. With a view towards increasing reach and access, we started by digitizing the Serious Game as an app and by condensing the one-day workshop into a two to three hour e-learning course. And I'll be speaking to all of these. In our most recent phase under Shoshana's leadership, we also piloted leadership coaching primarily with our team essentials for engaging families in care, but also with one home here in Ottawa, Ontario, the Pearly Rideau Veterans Centre. We'll be presenting about that experience at the upcoming Advantage Ontario Convention in May. And if you're there, we hope to see you. And please come see us at our Ontario CLRI booth. All right, let's begin with the clinical frameworks that form the foundation for the training. There are three clinical frameworks, the three R's, the sensory observation system, and SBAR. The three R's clinical framework really provides a foundation for clinical reasoning skills. And the learners can use this with, in the face of any situation. So it's recognize, reflect, and respond. It's a sequential process in which learners are encouraged to first recognize and understand the situation. So signs, symptoms, prioritization, then reflect upon their knowledge, observations and assessment, and finally to respond appropriately, interventions, reporting and follow-up. The sensory observation system is a tool that promotes systematic head-to-toe assessments of clients to help recognize, prioritize, reflect, and respond to subtle and acute changes in the health status of our elderly residents. And here you're seeing it as it appears in our pocket guide. So the tool is grounded in the senses, sight, touch, hearing, smell. Um, these are used for observations and grouped by system. And we developed this in conjunction with PSWs and nurses, and they found that grounding it in their senses, what they were actually seeing, touching, feeling, smelling while they were providing care was a really helpful way to shift their focus from task and to be more present in the moment. So SOS provides a systematic checklist to use when observing and assessing physical, cognitive, emotional, behavioral, and functional changes in residents in order to prevent worsening of their condition. You also see that some things are highlighted in orange and those are more urgent concerns that staff should be escalating sooner than later. Reflection is also promoted through the sensory observation system. So the pocket card has the SOS. It is structured according to the three R's. And as I'll show soon, also includes the SBAR tool. And for homes that participate in Team Essentials, we make these pocket cards available.
Okay. So SBAR communication as a tool is used across many industries, but also in healthcare to succinctly organize and communicate essential information to coordinate a team response. Um, it's often, it offers learners a concise and systematic way to provide accurate information to the care team and beyond. And it's not only for acute emergencies, but also for less urgent situations such as team huddles or rounds. We have found that it is really quite important for PSWs to be able to prioritize their concerns and use language that triggers the nurse's brain. Um, nurses really appreciate concise and prioritized concerns from PSWs so that they know if they're being interrupted, for example, during medication rounds, then they know that the PSW has an urgent concern rather than a less urgent concern, for example. So it, the SBAR is in the pocket guide. And again, there are some worksheets available as people learn uh, to practice SBAR. Okay, so these clinical tools, the three clinical tools are embedded into training resources, which are delivered in a variety of ways. So let's start with the workshop. Uh, the workshop is a one-day in-person seven-hour event. We offer follow-up consultations to homes in Ontario, either in person or virtually, as well as the option of leadership coaching uh, before, during, and after the training. Similarly, uh, those two things are also offered for the e-learning course version. It's a two to three hour online course, and that's available virtually. The SOS game app for seniors care is accessible anywhere, anytime. And finally, uh, for homes and staff who are at a far distance uh, from Baycrest, we have also embedded our team essentials into an online postgraduate certificate. And I'll be talking a little bit about that. The one day workshop is highly experiential. There are cases used, videos, imagery, reflection, active learning, and so on. Um, and really we do a deeper dive into a review of conditions and applying SOS to activities of daily living. And I think this is a helpful refresher for many staff. As we know, uh, nurses can become quite isolated in long-term care if they're the only nurse on shift, for example. And so it's nice to have a refresher and keep one's skills up to date. And so sometimes the longer workshop is the best way to do that. It's team-based participation and registration. So this is, Team Essentials is about improving teamwork. And so we ask that homes identify a care area that they want to start with, one or two, and that they send about 80% of the staff to get trained. We recommend that uh, triads or quads of team members who regularly work together on the same shift with the same clients register and participate in the training together. So if there's a nurse and two to three unregulated staff or an allied health profession and two to three PSWs that normally work together, that can come together, that seems to have the best effect in terms of us being able to address team dynamics in real time and to give them aha moments, if you will, about how they work together as a team. And so it's a team building exercise in and of itself. We offer these on site at Baycrest in Toronto, Ontario. We have delivered in other locations in Ontario. And, and so if you're interested, please contact us. Uh, on the right, you can see part of the agenda. You'll notice in orange, we've embedded the three R's and the sensory observation system and later on SBAR. So here again, it's a picture of one of those interactive um, activities we do around what symptoms they observe uh, and how those relate to the different conditions. Uh, here you can see that SBAR is embedded. Um, also the this SOS game app for seniors care is introduced and played. And we also focus on team uh, 
competencies during the day. So in terms of outcomes, um, when we ask at the beginning, how well do you close the communication loop? Only 26% of them said agreed a lot. Both PSW and nurses self-reported that. However, when we go back three to six months post-workshop, right, uh, about 44% of PSWs will say that their nurses are better at closing the communication loop. And likewise, about 44% of nurses say that PSW's reports are more descriptive and systematic. We also asked them at the beginning how much they think about how my actions and attitudes affect the team. So 55% agreed a lot, and that increased to nearly 75% at three to six months post-workshop. So that's a substantial improvement and evidence that behaviors and attitude changes are being sustained into practice. Um, some other indicators that practice change is happening is 57% are using a common language, 55% better at catching early signs and symptoms of changes, and 60% say they are getting better at prioritizing urgent signs and symptoms. Now we think we can still do better and leadership coaching is one of the approaches that we are now applying to improve those numbers even further. Team members also express greater confidence in evaluating, organizing, and prioritizing resident needs. They were able to immediately apply it in practice. Uh, for example, they spoke of using mid-shift huddles as a means to improve communication across care roles. Some teams also came up with a one-page solution where PSWs would write the concern, the nurse would come back and sign off on that concern once she had addressed it so that they knew that the problem had been, or the issue had been addressed. So some closed loop communication strategies. And it's very helpful when leaders are there to support embedding those types of solutions into regular standard operating procedures. So we were asked to make the workshop more accessible. Um, and so nobody wants to do seven hours of e-learning, uh, but we did manage to narrow it down to a two hour e-learning course. It might take a little longer if you uh, are less familiar with using a computer or if English is not your first language. So we say two to three hours to complete. Um, it's targeted to nurses, PSWs, and our allied health professions. There are approximately one module per step in the sequence of care. So there are a total of about 12 modules. They are 10 to 20 minutes each. And one of the nice things is that you can log off anytime and resume later at the exact same place that you left off. So if you have to step away, you can. You don't have to start all over again. Um, currently, we're working with Surge Learning, which is one of the uh, learning management systems that many homes in Ontario use uh, to upload it there. So you'll be able to access it through Surge Learning in conjunction with partnering with us. And also, uh, we offer it through our Baycrest learning management system. And as you'll see, this is behavior-based e-learning. Just a few slides to really point out that the interprofessional aspects of care are very much emphasized. And so uh, it's kind of like a bit of a choose your own adventure. So you enter each section in a particular role and are asked to click on icons to open up other care providers' perspectives uh, to ensure that um, you understand what the other team members are bringing. Uh, for those who want to know what's covered, there is a brief review of conditions. You can see below on the left, heart failure is brought up, but it is not the deep dive that we would do in the workshop. Um, it's not, you know, as fulsome or assessment focused. It's, it's a brief overview, but that's okay. You may be able to supp supplement that training yourself. There's a section on delirium and pain, and also there's a focus on instability. So self-reflection is embedded in the course. 
Now, as an educator or a leader, if you do engage your teams in this e-learning course, since we know that it's best to space it out in half hour increments, maybe a half hour a week over six weeks, you can take some of these self-reflection exercise and actually engage your teams on a weekly basis in, in dialogue around these issues. That's the best way for teams to get to know each other. And we like to do a strengths-based approach. So here we're asking you, you know, what strengths can you actually bring to the team? What are you really good at? And what skill do you want to improve on? And if you're facilitating this conversation, you can make linkages between people who have great skills and people who are wanting to learn those skills. So who can you go to for help? It's a good team conversation. Uh, so these are real world cases uh, grounded in problem-based learning. So very in keeping with adult learning principles. There are several cases. Uh, Mrs. Jones is the one case that follows through the whole uh, e-course, um, but there are also little short videos of other clients, and uh, we also have some videos of SBAR reports, so you get to evaluate how well you think Jennifer is doing her SBAR reports. There are also a number of animations that are used. Um, here, this one focuses on real clarity. There are a variety of knowledge checks. So rather than power, flipping through a PowerPoint and doing a quiz at the end, the quiz, if you will, is embedded throughout the course. And you need to complete certain actions or activities to demonstrate that you know or have mastered the work. And so that is how you progress through the module. So there's no quiz at the end, it's embedded throughout. Again, it's behavior-based. Uh, so you can see very much that uh, you, you need to make some actions. You need to prioritize here um, and, and think about what you need to do to set the team and the client up for success. The last two modules actually are set up just like the SOS gaming app where you're presented with a case and you have to work through it like you would on the app. And this is a way that we scaffold learners to transition from the e-learning course into the SOS game app. So that's the next focus. Um, this is case-based learning uh, in a serious game format to enhance specialty knowledge for acute deterioration in long-term care. Uh, there's organizational access through a web version of the app, and in the next two weeks, we will expect to have it up on our Apple and Google Play stores. So right now, what I'm going to do is share a video with you of how the video works. How, sorry, how the app works. <laughs> All right, here we go. Just a moment, please. Can't tell if it's playing. Oh, there we go. SOS is an evidence-based app that uses gamified simulation to create a highly engaging learning environment to improve knowledge application and reasoning skills. Early generation games for education use sets of questions with simple reward systems such as points, badges, and leaderboards, which are now outdated. SOS uses current neuroscience data to build deeper, more complex games with more flexibility for the learner and the educator. The game uses a forced choice decision. choice decision model to deactivate default mode processors in the cortex to increase focus on essential information for learning. 
It also uses Markov's decision-making processes to enable learners to choose the best actions among many and complex situations. SOS uses titrated challenges and reward systems to activate the ventral striatum. This increases the activation of learning reward processes in the brain to engage the learner. The game uses multiple compulsion loops and confidence-building mechanics such as power-ups and self-efficacy ratings. These engage users in exploring content, rehearsing skills, and playing longer. SOS can scale and overcome the limitations of in-situ and expensive simulations for real-world problems. It can be played anywhere, anytime, on any device. The game provides instant performance feedback that supports learner self-assessment and self-directed learning. It has demonstrated improvements in learning curves associated with more gameplay. The more learners play, the more cases they solve. Analytics are generated for educational assessment of learners. The game can be adapted for use across all learning disciplines through self-authoring. Educators can quickly push out new content to support burst instruction. Gameful design plus serious content equals serious learning. It's our first webinar, so we might have had a little technical glitch on the volume, but this video is available on the CLRI website, so you feel free to access it again. All right. Just going. All right. So in terms of design, uh, these are really 90 second cases with immediate feedback and the goal is to foster clinical reasoning. Uh, the goal um, is available anytime, anywhere, and there is an analytic dashboard available to organizations. So your educator uh, is able to go in and see how the team is performing. Um, here, just to show you that the learning objectives, so for example, knowledge of health conditions, is really about pattern recognition, so learning efficacy. So we have linked case studies and we randomize the case stems. So each case that we have in the game supports one to three cases. And there's a lot of randomization that happens um, so that in the evidence-based response, all the distractors, so all the wrong answers are randomized. And so it's very difficult to memorize. It's not quiz-based, so it's not about memorization. It's actually about reflecting and using your clinical reasoning skills to solve. So this is a can offer a valuable learning assessment tool. Um, so here is an example from a group of practical nursing students who played for about three weeks. And you can see that at the bottom, they did very well when the symptoms presented in a localized fashion, but that they really needed much more support with generalized symptoms and in fact, cardiac cases. And so that was very useful for us and for the clinical instructors to understand how to focus uh, the next steps in their, in their training and education. So students uh, and instructors provided feedback. Uh, one of the nice anecdotes is when the physician said to the students, wow, you're, you're really organized in how you're speaking to me. That was a win for everybody. Um, and students really liked the idea of um, prioritization, assessment, recognition and attention to detail, how they were able to organize their thoughts. And I really like this idea of self-reflection and self-evaluation that the kind of self-pacing they were able to do in the app, as well as look at the, their performance, their personal performance on the app to see where they were doing well and where they needed improvement, really fostered self-reflection and self-evaluation. So they thought it was fun and a great way to learn. Um, 
The next way that we have made uh, Team Essentials available is through a collaboration with George Brown College and the Chang School at Ryerson University. This is an online postgraduate interprofessional certificate in complex and long-term care. It opens up its first intake in September, targeting PSW, nursing, social work, and therapeutic recreation. And the idea is that you can learn where you live. It's completely online. George Brown College will facilitate an in-situ placement where you live, and your coursework will be supplemented by a virtual placement course. Uh, in a virtual space uh, where we've created a learning environment that everybody can come together. There is a full 28-week course, but there is also a four-course uh, sub-certificate. It's about 168 hours that features mostly the Team Essentials-based uh, courses. And the contact for that is uh, Dr. Wendy Ellis, Academic Chair at George Brown College. All right, let's go on to the third and final section uh, to look at some ways we can effectively move what is being learned into practice and how you can support that in, with the idea of spaced education being better than education as a one-time event. So leadership coaching is something that uh, we came to offer. Uh, it's often difficult for leaders to attend a full day training session. And so we thought, let's go to them. Let's create very tailored overview of what is learned and help them identify the critical behaviors that they would like to see in their staff to support performance change and better outcomes. So as per Brinkerhoff, in order to get that 85% uptake, Training the team is only really a quarter of the solution. Obviously, it needs to still be high quality, and the better it is in terms of it being experiential, the more impactful it will be. But in fact, 75% of the effort comes before and after. So a quarter of the effort is really about setting the stage. That means creating a shared vision with your teams, clarifying what you expect of them when they return from training, and letting them know what resources, processes, and support they will have to enable sustained practice change. When they come back from training, this is when 50% of the effort needs to come, uh, where leaders and educators are reinforcing in real time and through spaced education, what was learned, as well as by monitoring how well the new skills and behaviors are being taken up and adjusting their standard operating procedures or processes to reflect the new practices. All right, so what we've been doing is an eight to 12 week cycle so that it fits within one fiscal quarter of leadership coaching. Um, this is for homes that have quality improvement plans, QUIPs that prioritize preventable emergency transfers. It's available on a limited basis. Um, we're really looking for homes that are ready to commit. Um, we tailor the training to the home's performance needs and we ask the home to commit to regular leadership check-ins with the CLRI team to actively reinforce critical behaviors within existing quality improvement processes in the home, to have leaders and their teams participate in evaluations of team essentials, and also a commitment to sharing some of the outcome data. So we do engage in a quality improvement plan review related to the particular indicator that you're targeting. Um, we do offer a huddle guide and a huddle facilitation review so that leaders can learn how to bring their staff together to better implement what has been learned into practice. And new for next fiscal, we are now starting to design a train the trainer program for Team Essentials. And essentially we want to build internal capacity within the homes to roll out um, the sections that they have learned to other care areas. So in 
next fiscal, um, we are going to be looking for people to partner with, uh, looking for trainers and long-term care homes in Ontario that uh, have prioritized one of these areas in their QIP and would like to develop some in-house capacity to continue rolling it out beyond uh, the one initial target area. So the idea would be training the trainers uh, the first half of the year and then moving to implementation in the home. So if you're interested, please do reach out. Okay, so here are some complimentary tools. So after people have had the workshop or the e-learning course and they have their pocket card, there is also an SOS reference website uh, that includes the three R's and SBAR as well as a glossary. And so this is a reference for people to go back to. Um, it really kind of breaks down all the sections again uh, that are covered in the workshop. So it's a great way to refresh. And within this, you can access a complimentary tool about the conditions themselves. And this has been designed to um, modify itself to fit different screens. So if you're using a handheld or if you're using a computer, the screen will shift and accommodate your screen size. And so we thought that would be very helpful depending how and when staff need to access information on the actual conditions. And here you can see that each condition gets broken down by risks, pathophysiology, signs and symptoms, and treatment. And that is, of course, available for free on the website. Okay. Another tool that may be of interest to you is around our frail aging simulations. Um, this is really, if your goal is, if you have needs around kind of refreshing empathy uh, and knowledge of changes associated with frail aging, this may be a good tool that will fit your learning objectives. Uh, so there's a complete simulation toolkit about frail aging available for free on the website as well as a fact sheet about age-related changes that we should all know about. And a couple of videos, I'm going to show you one and hopefully get the volume right this time. <laughs> and um, the one I'm not going to show you is the do-it-yourself frail aging simulation suit. So our guy here on the right in the orange frail aging suit, this is a suit from Japan. It costs about three to four thousand dollars, depending on taxes and shipping and all that to bring in. So it's a bit expensive. But you can do a do-it-yourself frail aging suit at the dollar store. If you spend 60 bucks, you can probably get, you know, 40 or 50 people through a, a, a frail aging simulation. So don't let this suit intimidate you. It's not necessary <laughs> to do that. Okay, we're going to have another go at a video here. I'll try and do it right this time. Hey, I'm going to my doctor's appointment. That doctor better be on time. So Daniel, if you could get up and grab your medical form. Daniel, come on. Seriously. What about if you hold it closer to your face? And tiring. That's another thing that was surprising. Getting up and down was tiring. And that's why I was half joking, half not. When I was like, really, you're going to ask me to get up again? Almost angry at my inability to do things easily. I don't know whether it was because I was embarrassed or frustrated or I was getting hot. I was tearing up there, and I felt tired after. 
it was really an eye-opening experience for me and uh, again to remember in practice or you know when you're with a resident or in my case with patients having lived through it in a sense today being in their shoes really opens up your eyes to reality like while I was doing the walking I was kind of just thinking back to my patients and kind of seeing how they feel I was analyzing my movement and what how my gait was altered and I'm just thinking in my physiotherapy head, okay, this is why they do this kind of gait pattern. It'll just continue to reinforce that I need to adapt to their needs. They don't need to adapt to my needs as mm -hmm. a clinician. And I think this is just critical in our field to continue to focus on. And we do in a system of care needs to be crafted around what does our patient need. So again, that video is available on the website, as is the video for the do-it-yourself suit. Um, staff have had really impactful uh, experiences doing this um, that they take away for weeks uh, and think about um, the isolation that they felt, um, sort of being left without, you know, with less vision, less hearing, and so on, less mobility. It can be very impactful. We also have a team puzzle activity on the website. Um, we use this during our workshop day, and this is a really great way to mimic teamwork. Um, it essentially consists of a three minute time pressured task of completing a 12 piece puzzle. The first group to complete wins a prize. Uh, now, they don't know what the subject of the puzzle is, so there's no picture to tell them, and they don't know that there is a missing piece. And this is a nice entry-level simulation where you can help the team draw parallels between how they functioned completing the puzzle and how lessons learned here can apply to actual practice. And I really like bringing home the message around the missing piece. Um, and that is, please speak up. Maybe you're the missing piece of the puzzle when it comes to the resident and you know something that others don't. So that's available again uh, for free on the website. Also, um, if your home uses the confusion assessment method for delirium, this toolkit may be of interest. It is designed for educators and is available for free on the CLRI website. It includes the guide as well as a slide deck and handouts and an evaluation tool that you can modify for your home, as well as three practice video simulations that you can play and discuss as a team as you complete the CAM. Okay. All right, so there we go. We're just about 53 minutes and uh, just wanted to thank you for sticking with me for so far. So in summary, we've reviewed the three clinical frameworks as well as how those are embedded in various experiential delivery methods. And finally, we explored how these training tools can be used to optimize the effective transfer and uptake of learning to practice for improved performance. So there are various ways that uh, you can get in contact with us. So please feel free to do that. And finally, this is an opportunity for comments or questions. I'll be looking at the chat. Um, I don't know if you want to raise your hand. We could try that too, if you would like to become unmuted. Um, please contact me if you have any kind of general questions about the training tools themselves. Um, all Ontario long-term care homes that are looking to access uh, the e-learning or the app can contact me directly. And all other organizations looking to access training tools that aren't on the web are welcome to contact my counterpart here at Baycrest, Lisa Sokoloff, who manages our training and simulation division. So thank you so much for joining us today. All right, let's have a look at the chat. Hmm, looks pretty quiet. Um, okay, does anyone?
Uh, unanswered questions. Oh. oh, I see Jen Plant on here. Thanks for joining, Jen. Um, there are people here that are indicating they have unanswered questions. Do you want to add them to the chat or put your hand up? Oh, Yvonne. Yvonne. Let's. If you want to unmute Yvonne, do you have Yvonne Dale? Do you have a question? Ah, uh, here we go. Uh, oh, here we go. So this presentation, Carrie Ann, will be is going to be recorded, and you'll get a link to the full recording. Um, the SOS Pocket Guide, Alex. Oh, he's left, but uh, you can certainly access it by connecting with me. Uh, we do like it to be um, used in conjunction with the training. It's not a standalone item. The app is not yet in the Play Store, Kim. It will be up uh, in the next week, I hope, next two weeks. If you're really interested in a slide deck, we could certainly um, convert it and send it to you because I'm getting another request for that. Oh, Kavita, how can we access uh, the training through Surge Learning? Uh, well, certainly what you need to do is contact me and we'll work with Surge to open it up for your home. Ah, so Kathleen is asking, um, do we see this as a tr tool for training as something that could be offered to family members of individuals in long-term care? Um, so that's an interesting question. I think that uh, the first video from that we sh the clip uh, that I mentioned, I didn't show it to you. It's the video clip from Alberta. The Alberta group is quite appropriate to families. Uh, the training that we have now is really based on qualifications and credentials expected of unregulated workers and regulated workers. And so it's maybe too specific at this point uh, for families. It would need to, I think, be modified. So Mary Ann is asking, how do we access the e-learning course? You contact me and we'll figure out how to best do that for your organization. Priscilla, what is the cost factor for George Brown e-learning course? Ah, so the George Brown online certificate, I don't have the answer to that in my head, but um, again, I would shoot off a quick email to Wendy Enman. Um, and when I circulate the slide deck, you'll have her email. I'm sure Wendy will be happy to help you. What is the prerequisite for the new certificate in September? Um, I think the, uh, the prereq is that you need to have graduated from either a PSW program or a, health re a regulated health professions program. Um, and they're looking for the first intake to include PSWs, social workers, nurses, and therapeutic recreation. Ah, uh, some Sumit, uh, where can we get the pocket guide? You can contact me. We like to send that out with the actual training. Thanks, Heather. Um, Sumit, um, the cost for a one day in person workshop uh, varies. Uh, so for Ontario Long Term Cares, we offer them for free and we tend to provide backfills. So usually for Ontario Long Term Care Homes, there's no cost for the workshop. Uh, Renee, is there a cost for having it? Um, where did Renee's go? Oh, is there a cost for having the workshop offered on site at our organization? Uh, not if you are in Ontario, and we try to uh, minimize the cost to Ontario long term care homes, uh, but we would like to have a really good sized group if we do that so that uh, we make the most of it. And we've encouraged homes to band together. So if you have one or three homes in your area that would like to do this together and ha run a few sessions, uh, then we would partner with you to bring educators to you. 
And potentially, we could also at the same time train trainers in your organizations to continue the learning with other teams. Um, so, in terms of the train the trainer program, uh, no, I don't believe there is a cost. Uh, again, for Ontario long-term care homes, we're trying to deliver these for free uh, or at cost recovery, and I don't anticipate a cost at this time. Uh, what's a good size for a workshop, Renee? Um, that would be about, we like to do them as, uh, so acute would be around uh, 20 to 30 people. And I'm sorry, I don't actually know the application deadline for the George Brown e-course, but there is a link in the in this in the slide deck that we'll be sending around. Great questions, everyone. I I hope that that you found this uh, to be valuable. Um, certainly, the minutes, it's time to go. It's two o'clock. Look at that. Um, so please complete your evaluation forms. It helps us to let the ministry know uh, whether these these uh, tools and the services we offer are of value and we feed that back to them. All right, everyone, uh, feel free to reach out if you'd like to talk some more and explore how this could be helpful to your organization. Thanks for joining.